Luke 21. We left off our reading this morning in verse number 11. And that verse said, In great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famine, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. Now look at verse number 12. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Again, God doesn't just let you go through something. Go through it. Hmm? Look in verse 14. Sell it, therefore, in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not a hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for how good you are. We thank you for the good singing and the good testimonies tonight. Lord, you've already helped us tonight in the service. Now, Father, I again pray for Brother Randy's mother, Brother Randy's family. You know what is needed. And God, we pray that you'd work and you'd orchestrate in the events, and we pray that your will would be done. I pray for Brother Ronnie tonight. You'd touch him and help him. I pray for those that are sick. You would help them and be with them. Father, I pray for those that are working with the children on the other side of the building, that, Lord, you would uh, use them, give them wisdom. And I pray those little precious minds over there would hear about Jesus and those that have not reached the age of accountability, they would store it up in their precious little hearts. When they come to that age of accountability, they trust Christ at a young age. Uh, those that have uh, uh, reached the age of accountability and have not been saved yet, I pray you'd continue to touch their hearts, open their eyes to truth. And God, I pray they'd be saved uh, while they're yet young. I pray for those that are working with our teens, that you'd bless their efforts. And God, I certainly pray you'd undergird them and help them with all the peer pressure that those young people are facing today. And I pray you'd be with them. And God, you'd put a hedge about them. And then, Father, I pray you'd help us tonight to glean from the Scriptures, help us to grow closer to Christ. Uh, help us, Lord, to take to heart what thus saith the Lord. Uh, strengthen that one that's weak. Help that one that's struggling. Uh, be with that one that may be low in a valley tonight. And certainly if there's one lost, I pray tonight would be the night of their salvation. Uh, help us tonight, we do pray. Use this unworthy vessel. We'll thank you for it, for it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen and amen. I want to look at this uh, as Jesus has told them a little bit about the end times. And now he looks to them and tells them about their time. Can I say it's wonderful to think about the wonderful sweet by and by. But we do live in the nasty now and now. We do face things. The Bible says, Yea, all they that live godly shall suffer persecution. And we go through some things. And sometimes when we're going through something, we think we're the only one in the world that's going through things. The beauty about having a church, we can come together, we can bear one another burdens, when folks get to testify, and we find out there are a lot of folks going through things. Uh, I've said for years, behind the smiles that uh, come uh, on, on faces of folks coming to church, uh, there may be heartbreak, there may be tears, there may be hardship, uh, and my dear friends, when they come to church, they ought to come to an environment where they'll get some help. And so we see that Jesus is about ready to deal with them what is about to befall them. Can I say, the Lord always tries to warn us and tries to grow us and try to ready us for what comes ahead. I've said in times gone by, you may not need a message tonight, but you better store it up because there's coming a day you're going to need the message. And my dear friends, as we look at this tonight, notice, if you will, the persecution. He says in verse number 12, 
but before all these they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering up synagogues and prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And he said, you're going to be persecuted. I'd like to tell you that everybody's going to just love you and want to hear what you have to say about the gospel. They're all going to just appreciate your stands for God. They're all going to say it's wonderful. Uh, uh, everybody you're going to invite to church is going to come to church with you. Your family's going to always support you in everything you do, but that's just not always the case. A lot of times you tell somebody about Jesus, they look at you like you got two heads. They look at you like you're a freak. If, if you tell them you went to church today... They're really going to think you're crazy. You get on the job tomorrow, Brother Brian, you say, hey, hallelujah, you had church. You still had church. Don't you know there's the coronavirus? Don't you know? Can I help you something? The coronavirus may be a terrible thing, but hell's very hot today. That, my dear friend, is something to be worried about. And this crowd that's worried about a disease, they better be worried what's on the other side of that disease in the other side of eternity called hell. But listen, he tells them they're going to be persecuted. I've said it for years. God never promised any of us a rose garden. He just promised to be the rose of Sharon. Amen. He'll never let you go through anything alone. He'll always be there. and He'll be a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. But notice the poise that he instructs them in. Look at verse 14. Verse 14 says, Settle it, therefore, in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. Notice what he tells them. He says, you need to have some poise. He says, settle it in your hearts. You know what happens to a lot of people, Miss Marcy? They get blindsided because they're not settled. Can I help you with something? One of the greatest compliments that I've, I've, I've gotten in, in recent, you know, my thinking, somebody came in this morning, said that they were confronted uh, 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 sometime this week and said, uh, 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 churches are closing, or is your church going to close? And, and their response was, uh, you don't know my pastor. Amen. That is a great compliment. There was no question. See, this thing's been settled in my heart for a long time. I'm going to serve Jesus. Uh, come what may, uh, I'm not backing up. I'm going to serve the Lord. Uh, 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 the Bible's real. Jesus is real. Uh, and I just learned a long time ago, uh, as long as I hang with Him, it'll be all right. Huh? It's never a question. Hmm? You know, my mom was in heaven tonight, but I used to tell her, Mom, if time goes on long enough, uh, you're going to have to come visit me in prison. Uh, there are just some things, I don't care how many laws they pass, uh, I'm never going to marry a queer. It's not going to happen. Uh, I'm never going to stand with homosexuals and say it's okay. It's not going to happen. Uh, I'm never going to have uh, an alternate lifestyle that's okay with me. You've done heard me preach. Uh, it's not okay to be gay, and it never will be. Uh, and friends, I don't care what the government says. Uh, I don't care what society says. Uh, I care what God says. Uh, and if it's an abomination to God, uh, it's already set in my heart. Uh, I'm not going to hang with her. Are you listening? Mm. But there are so many people. I have phone calls. I don't know what to do. You know why? Because it's not settled in your life. Mm. What are you going to do next week when it's something else? And next week after that, when it's something else, uh, and when it's this pressure and that pressure, uh, uh, listen, uh, 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 I settled it a long time ago. Uh, uh, I'm just going to go where Jesus goes. I'm just going to do what Jesus says. Uh, and if it pleases Jesus, uh, by His grace, that's what I want to do. huh? He told them to settle it in their hearts before it ever happened. And He said, settle it that you don't, you don't make up what you're going to say ahead of time. You just set up in your hearts that you're going to be committed to me and I'll give you what to say when you need to say it. Can I say this? We should be poised. We're to be settled. We're to make a stand. He's telling them you're going to have to make a stand. You're going to be persecuted for it. But you're going to make a stand because it's going to be a testimony unto me. So you need to be settled 
and you need to make a stand. You've heard me say it. Uh, somebody don't stand for something will fall for anything. Hmm? Uh, uh, come what may, you're going to have to make a stand. I was telling Brother Phil before church this morning, my Aunt Lynn used to sing this song, uh, uh, and then Miss, me and Miss Nett stole it from her there for a little while. Uh, uh, but she sang that song, it's called Going Back, and it says there's coming a time uh, uh, that you need to make up your mind whether you're in or out. Uh, and the riding the fence days are over, friend. You're either for the Lord or you're against Him. Hmm? He said, you need to make up your mind. You're going to have to make a stand. You can't hide in the shadows and be a closet Christian. You're going to have to say, saved, guilty, going to heaven. If that offends you, sorry, not really, but I'm going to heaven. Mm -hmm. I love Jesus. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Could I help you with something? If you walk with Jesus, you don't have to say that. They already know it. You already don't talk like them. You don't go where they go. You don't act the way they act. You don't look the way they look. Uh, uh, you don't dress the way they dress. There's just a whole lot of things about you they already know. Mm. They just know. There's something about the countenance of somebody that's saved. Mm. I'll be out in public. I'll just look up. That's one of his. So is it because they got a bun on their head and a jean skirt? No. They're just some people in their character, their countenance. There's something about their spirit bears witness with my spirit. We've got a kindred spirit because we know the Holy Spirit. Are you listening? Hmm? Well, you need to just get this down. You need to be poised. You need to be settled. You need to make a stand. And can I say this? You need to submit. He tells them, you just submit to what I tell you to say and you're going to be so impressive to them that they're not going to be able to gainsay you or resist you. They're going to scratch their head and say, I didn't see it on that wise. Hmm? I've known people that's tried to figure me out. Good luck with that, huh? I just don't get you. Well, if you get Christ, you'll get me. Hmm. And we see there's persecution we see there's poise listen you can, you can be this close from having a halo and still get blindsided what I'm saying you can, you can walk circumspectly you can live a godly life you can be faithful to the things of God. You can be steadfast, unmovable. You can be as solid a Christian as there is and still get blindsided. That sorry devil don't play fair. And sometimes you can be so focused on the things of God you're not aware that there's been an enemy sneaking behind you. And you can absolutely get wild and blown over by something. You can but if you're settled and you're where you should be with Christ, it may dumbfound you. It may catch you by surprise. It may break your heart and feel like your very soul is about ready to lose perspective on everything you've ever faced before. But if you're anchored into him, Y'all remember them old punching bags? You used to blow them up. It took you forever. They didn't have pumps back then. You blow them up, and they kind of had sand on the bottom of them, and the kids would hit it, and they'd come back up. Well, that's what Christians do. You can take a punch if you're settled. Somebody may hit you, but you're coming right back up. Are you listening? Hmm? But a crowd that's not settled, they don't even need to be in a storm. They can just have a little breeze come their way, and it blows them out. Are you listening? We need to be poised. Hmm? Things aren't going to get better. They're going to get worse. So you need to be ready by being anchored into the things of God. We see that he deals with persecution. He deals with poise. But then he lets them know their plight. What a blessing this is. Look at verse 16. And ye shall be betrayed. Oh, that's always fun. How many likes uh, folks to betray you and stab you in the back and sucker punch you and all that? No, we don't like that at all. 
we we like them friends that are friends on your good days your bad days they're still your friend no you shall be betrayed but it gets worse both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends it's one thing if a co-worker throws you under the bus but when it's your parents I've known folks that got saved served God and they had to make a stand against their parents their parents weren't supportive I've known folks and there's some of you that you've got brothers and sisters uh, natural relatives they don't understand you they don't understand why you come to church they don't understand why, why you're so sold out to the things of God and certainly now that we got this uh, dreadful plague why are you here they don't understand it and they go behind your back and talk about you to your other siblings, talk about you like a dog. He said, you're going to be betrayed. Can I say, we can act like we're Superman and super Christian, but it cuts when family members cut your legs off from underneath you. Hmm? He says, you're going to be betrayed. He says, and some of you shall they, who? parents, brethren, kinfolks, and, and friends, shall they cause you to be put to death? Mercy. Huh? You know, I'm glad the Lord doesn't always tell us what we're going to have to face. I didn't last Valentine's Day decide I wanted to get in that cancer line. Hmm? That was a lot that was befalling me. But here, these folks are going in wide open. The Lord's telling them, some of you, your parents are going to have you put to death. That's harsh. By the way, these folks, he's telling, they didn't have a King James Bible under their arm. It hadn't been pinned down yet. All they're getting is his direct promise. That's all they're getting. Hmm? Man, I... Brother James's song, I love that song. Uh, uh, what a blessing. But what a blessing when our storms are, uh, are raging, we can get back in the Bible and find some help. They didn't have that. All they had to remember, what, what did the Lord tell me? Oh, yeah, my parents are going to cause me to die. Hmm? This is their plight. This is their lot in life. It goes on to say this. And ye shall be hated of just a few folks. Is that what it says? No, all men for my name's sake. What a blessing. Can I say it is a natural born thing that we want to be liked. We want to be liked. It upsets us if for no reason somebody don't like us. Hmm? That don't upset you because you don't really care. I know you. No, she does. She wants to be liked. Not much, but a little bit, huh? I used to beat myself up when folks would visit the church and never come back. First, I wanted to blame it on him. I said, well, he wasn't friendly enough. It's all Clint's fault. No. I used to beat myself, well, is it my style of preaching? Am I too direct? Am I too blunt? Am I too nasty? Am I too this? Am I too that? And I had to come to re realization one day, this is the way God made me, this is the way God called me, this is the way God put it in me, this is the way it comes out. And bless God, if they don't like it, they're going to have to take it up with God because, you know, I don't have any other control over it. Amen. But we want to be liked. Sure. He said, You're going to be hated by all men. Why? For his name's sake. There's some people that will despise you just because you name the name of Jesus. And then he says this, But there shall not an hair of your head perish. Now if you're just reading this face value, you'll think, well here he's told some of you are going to die, and here he said none of your hairs are going to perish. That's not what he's saying. He didn't say they weren't going to have to die. He said not a hair of your head is going to perish. In other words, you may have to go to the grave, but you're going to glory. Hmm? Amen. Yeah. Uh, so we see these verses, and uh, he is, he's expounding on what we looked at this morning, but I'm not going to preach on any of that stuff. I'm really interested in verse 19. 
I read verse 19, then I read it again, then I read it again, then I read it again, then I meditated on it, then I read it again, and it's one of them verses I knew there was just something here. And this verse is one of them verses that you chew on it long enough, you're going to realize it is a weighty verse. It says this, In your patience possess ye your souls. What a verse. I still haven't wrapped my head all the way around it, only to say this, what a verse. Now, I can confidently stand here tonight and tell you I've been saved by the grace of God my soul's been sealed unto the day of redemption and the Lord I'm in his hand his hands in the father's hand no man can pluck me out of the father's hand and the Lord possesses my soul but that's not what that verse says Oh, it doesn't question that I'm saved, blood washed, sealed by the Holy Spirit doesn't uh, question the fact I'm in his hand his hands in the father's hand but the Bible says, Jesus told them, in your patience possess ye your souls. James 1, uh, uh, 4 said it this way. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Your conduct, your character... The control of your very soul hinges on your and my patience. With that in mind, I want to preach for just a few minutes on the power of patience. Now, if you've known me more than ten minutes, you know that I'm not a patient person. I don't want you to pray God gives me patience. Because I've read what it comes you know, before patience, trials, tribulation, persecution, all those kind of things what brings patience. I've seen what Job had to go through to become patient. And so we're, I, I don't pray that God makes me patient. And I don't want you to pray that God makes me patient. And I'm just not that way. I'm not wired that way. But there is something to learning on how to wait on God. And when you're patient with God and let God work on you and work on me, we are in control of our soul. There is power in patience. We all know that song, the youth choir just sang it not long ago, on He's Still Working On Me. Can I say, that until we get that body like Christ, He'll always be working on us. In our flesh dwelleth no good thing. We constantly need to be worked on. It's kind of like them old Chevys you had, that old Chevelle, always tinkering on it. That old pickup truck, always tinkering on it. Huh? Thank God they used to make them where you could tinker on them. Now they come to a point, it's just easier to just throw it in, in the junkyard and buy another one before you have to work on it because uh, uh, what you got to pay, now they got cars with brains in them, huh? Anyway, that's a whole other story. Can I say, God is working on us. He's always tinkering on us. And as His children, we've got to learn to let Him work on us. Let Him. He's the potter, we're the clay. Sometimes he's throwing some oil of the Holy Ghost on us. Sometimes he's throwing water on us from the washing of the Word of God to make us more pliable, to make us an instrument that he can use in fashion that others can see his handiwork. We're not as the clay supposed to dictate to the potter what we will or will not do. Can I say, don't know much about pottery making. But I do know that when the, the clay is extracted, it's sometimes got things in it that hurt the clay. There's residues in the clay that will crack under pressure. So the potter, uh, he puts water on that clay and oil on that clay in order to smooth out all the roughness and all the things that will crack under the pressure. So when the fire is put to the clay, the clay will withstand it. Uh, and even if it does crack, we've got a potter that knows how to pick up the pieces and start working again. But we 
have to learn. All this leading up to this verse is talking about persecutions and the plight and the betrayal and the hatred and all those things. And he says, wait a second though, in your patience, you possess your soul. And so he's telling us there is power in patience. Can I say the power to control our soul lies within mm, several things. Can I say, first of all, it lies within dependence. We need to, more than just let the words roll off of our tongue, we really need to trust Him. We really need to have faith that He does know what's best and that He does do all things well. When we totally depend on Him, we are controlling our soul. We're controlling the seat of our emotions. We're controlling how we will be settled and poised and be able to handle certain things. My wife's sitting right there. You know she's a nurse. You know she's the one that told me I had cancer. And she will tell you that I, I, I told her, I said, this didn't catch God by surprise. It'll be okay. I'm sitting here a year later, cancer-free. Oh, we had a few couple rough weeks, uh, but God brought us through it. God's been good. Uh, and I can't help but believe it's because I just knew it was in His hand. Uh, I didn't waver. I just trusted Him. Uh, and God did the work. Uh, now I go to meetings and I've got messages where I can bring that out and tell how great God is and it's helping other people around the country just telling how good God is. Can I say something? The power to control our soul, the power of patience, the power of possessing our soul begins with dependence. I've said this before. How can we trust God to save us and take us to heaven but we can't trust Him to help us in our daily walk? Oh, God can take me to heaven when I die, but He can't keep me from coronavirus. I just, I'm glad my faith isn't on shifting sand. I just believe He's a big God. I'm convinced there's some people that know Him, Brother Clint, but they just need a bigger God. They just don't trust Him enough. Huh? Lord, have mercy. I... I, I, let me go pick on Clint. I haven't picked on him in a long time. He looks good back there. Miss Rhonda's doing a lot with nothing. <laughs> I can't imagine when your boy is in them hot spots. You know, every day he's a target. Every day it could be his last day. It's out of your control. There's nothing you could do to ensure that he's coming home safely. All you had was to depend on God. Hmm? I want to tell you something. You need a big God on them days. Hmm? You need a big God. You're raising three grandbabies. You're old. Hmm? You're also colorblind. No, I like it. I like it. It's definitely you, huh? I like it. You're raising them three grandbabies. And I know you take that seriously. And I know you want them to be around God's people and to be around the church. And you're trying to make a normal life for them because they have faced more in their little lives than most people will ever face it. I know you hurt for them, but I know. You know it's got to be in God's hands. You depend on God every day. You have to. One bad choice and you send them spiraling down the same road that some of their parents did. Every day. You've got to depend on them. Every day. Hmm? Little Mike, little Maddie's pretty as can be. When you got her, you're trying to instill things of God in her, and you're trying to teach her about Jesus and all, but you also know when she's with her mama, she's not getting that. She's getting a lot of things to refute what you're trying to teach her. Well, you got to depend on God. you got to give it to Jesus. you got to let patience have its perfect work. And I could go around the building, huh? And just talk to each and every one of you, things you're facing. I'm here to tell you, if you're going to have any control over your soul, if you're going to have poise, if you're going to be able to handle the pressures, it starts with dependence. Not on your abilities. Not on what you know. 
You've got to learn to depend on Him. Depend on Him. Isaiah chapter number 40, you know the verse. Verse number 31 simply says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They that mount up with wings as equal, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Can I say? The power of patience, the power to control our soul, the power to have poise and be able to withstand whatever the devil throws at us begins with dependence. Can I say, secondly, it takes devotion. Hmm. It takes devotion. It's easy to praise God and tell everybody how great God is when you're on the mountaintop, the bills are paid, the kids aren't sick, and the grandkids aren't sick. Everything is wonderful. Nothing's breaking down at the house. The, everything's running well with the cars. Everything is wonderful. It's easy to say how great God is. But when the bottom falls out of everything and you're in the valley and you don't know which way is up and, you, and you're hurting and your heart broke and, and you don't know uh, 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 how any of it's going to ever work out, my dear friends, you've got to be devoted to God. Job in the ash pile said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord giveth, he taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If you can't serve him in the valley, you have no right to serve him on the mountaintop. You've got to be devoted, come what may. Whether it's storm clouds or whether it's sunshine, you need to be devoted. I thank God for the Wednesday night crowd. I thank God for the Sunday night crowd. The folks that are devoted when it's not convenient. Those that uh, 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 have everything coming against them and they still are dedicated to the things of God. But can I say, it's more than being dedicated to church, dedicated to Bible reading, dedicated to paying your time. It's being devoted to Him. We'd have revival if we'd fall in love with Jesus all over again. The one church in Revelation, that's what he said, I have somewhat against you because you left your first love. God help us to just be devoted and love to Him. I haven't used this analogy, you know, for for a while. But the truth of the matter is, do you think Miss Annette would put up on my sorry carcass if I walked in and said, "Hey, darling, I've been pretty faithful this week." No, pretty faithful don't cut it at the foster household. Huh? No, you got to be faithful. Well, how come we expect Jesus to let us just tell Him, "Well, we've been pretty faithful." Huh? Go tell your boss, man. Well, I'm going to be pretty faithful to the job the next few weeks. Huh? It doesn't work that way. How come we can be dedicated to our jobs? We can be dedicated to our spouses. We can be dedicated to our sports activities and sports teams, our kids active. But we can't be dedicated to Jesus because we've got a heart problem. And you're out of control. And you do realize when you're not possessing your soul, keeping it where it needs to be in the center of God's will, you do not realize your life is out of control. Go read Haggai chapter number 1. You sow, but you don't have enough to eat. You, you don't reap. You, you eat, but you don't have enough to eat. You drink, but you don't have enough drink. You earneth wages, put them into a bag of holes. Everything you do is just like a sieve. Nothing is blessed. Because you're not devoted to God. You put Jesus first. Hey, David said he'd never seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging bread. God knows how to take care of his own. But if you're not devoted to him, if you don't have that sweet fellowship and communion with him, friend, your whole life is going to be chaotic. If you're going to control your soul, if you're going to have poise, if you're going to be able to withstand what comes your way, you're going to have to depend on God. You're going to have to be devoted to God. And it's going to take discipline. I done told you I'm not patient. And being patient is not easy. It takes discipline. Every day you have to determine you're going to wait on God. You're going to have to wait on God. You're going to have to wait on God. I'll never forget. Years ago, uh, who's here came out of Orchard Street? Barry, Marcy, uh, Miss Kathy. Some of you have come lately and enjoy the church and everything. Uh, you need to praise the Lord for it, but you don't realize the adversity that the church went through 20 years ago. 
You don't realize that because of him and his daddy and Eddie, we even have a church tonight. This church got way down to just about a dozen people. They'd had a vote to close the doors. And the Howe boys kept it open. It's a blessing. We're indebted to them. And the Lord brought me here from victory. Some came from victory. Ray and Pam, Tammy and Thad. And the Lord started melting and doing some things. But what they didn't know is what we'd faced in victory. We didn't fight the devil by the acre. We, found, find, <laughs> we fought him by a millimeter down there. I mean, I mean, he was he's camped in, parked in, put his double wide there. I mean, he was there. So we had faced adversity. Then there was adversity at Orchard Street. And a lot of you folks came from Orchard Street. And I don't know if you remember, you remember that message I preached on the ministry of Emmanuel? I've been here about four or five months. Because everybody come from Orchard Street, they thought they was the only ones that faced anything. Folks from Emmanuel thought they was the only one that faced anything. Folks from Victory thought they was the only one that faced And we'd all faced a whole lot. And the message was geared at, hey, we've all faced something. Let's purpose in our heart that we don't go back there. And the Lord started just doing the work and started blessing and started adding. And I'll never forget, Brother Mike came to preach the first revival meeting in December. I came in October. He came in December. I told him, we're going to start a building program. He said, why don't you fill this one up first? I said, oh, yeah, we will. Don't, don't worry. You know, he ain't brought that up in a while. Huh? I need to bring that up to him. He comes and says, hey, what, what do you think about this? We're going to start another building program. Can I get your approval on this one? Huh? Well, say, what are you trying to say, preacher? Well, what I'm trying to say is, we had a young man through that process, and God was blessing the church, and the church started growing, and we filled that little building up. We was getting there. I mean, the Lord started sending folks in and started blessing, and folks started getting saved, and folks started coming. We had a, a young man that came, and he'd come a Sunday, and then you wouldn't see him for a couple weeks. And then he'd come a Sunday, and you wouldn't see him for a while. And then he'd come a couple Sundays. Well, the guy was talented. So I, if he came a couple weeks in a row, I'd ask him to sing. Well, he'd sing. Then you might not see him for three or four weeks. And then he'd come, come for a couple weeks, and I'd ask him to sing. I had somebody question me. They said, Preacher, that guy doesn't come all the time. Why do you let him sing? And this was my response. I said, we got to throw a dog a bone every now and then. I said, but why don't you do this? Instead of wondering why I let him sing, why don't you start praying for him? Well, it wasn't long the guy that questioned that. He came back to me and said, I want to thank you for that response. I've been praying and, boy, the Lord's done something in my heart. Oh, Lord. Oh, that guy started coming more regular. He started coming more regular. He started coming all the time. He surrendered to preach. And then God started blessing him. Today he's pastoring. You might know him. His name is Lawrence Longworth. I'm saying let patience have its perfect work. I'm glad that we've learned that around here, and I'm glad that uh, uh, we've learned that folks, when they come in, they're not always uh, maybe where they should be, or they don't always have all the rough edges knocked off of them. Some of them are coming from the gutters. Uh, some of them are coming from the scums. Because uh, some of them are coming from hurt places. Uh, and they come, uh, and the Lord instills them to come around here. Uh, we've learned that if you just love on them, uh, if you're good to them, uh, if you just watch God do something, uh, there's no telling how it will all end up. Are you listening? I'm just trying to say you just got to show some patience. You got to be disciplined. Hmm? Now I know there's a lot of other churches they'd never let somebody sing that didn't come all the time. Well, hey man, that's their conviction. Well, I'm here to tell you. I just read the Bible and Jesus was a friend of publicans and sinners. And I just try to be friend, folks. Are you listening? Hmm. It's easy to judge, folks. But I learned a long time ago, the Bible says if I don't judge somebody, 
then I won't be judged. And there's a whole lot of holes in my life, and I'd just soon nobody to, uh, get to digging around in there. Are you listening? So I'll just choose to love people instead of judge people. Are you listening? But it takes patience and, and, and it takes devotion, discipline because here's the thing. This old rotten flesh wants to judge everybody. This old rotten flesh on some days finds fault everywhere. Even when he's looking in the mirror. It takes discipline. Sometimes we've got to crucify this flesh anew. Sometimes we've got to beat it back down with the hammer of the Word of God. Are you listening? It takes discipline. You may run well for a while. And then all of a sudden, you might be at Walmart and hear some song that takes you back to the 70s. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, man, you're, right, you're back out there somewhere, all right? I'm trying to help you. Hey, just be disciplined. Just be patient. Just wait on God. Let God do a work and let patience have its perfect work. Hmm. You know, I, I commented today, you couldn't find no hot dog. I had people all over, you know, call me today. Hey, I found some hot dog buns. It, too late. Thad, Thad texted me and said he'd sell me a pack for 10 bucks. Hey, what a blessing. Uh, he's a good brother, isn't he? Uh, love you too, bro. Yeah, he said he's not working. He needs to make a little profit here. Stock market took a hit this week. Are you listening? Uh, but listen, Miss Annette and I, we ended up at, at the Kroger's out here in Burlington. We don't go there very often, and I knew why after we got in there. You can't find anything. It's all messed up and everything. We was out there. And so we're trying to find some things. We're trying to find hot dog bones. We're trying to find a few things. We just we did, only had to pick up a few things. And she said, well, how in the world? Let's just go to our Kroger's. Let's, I said, we're here. Let's get what we need to get. And so we're walking around there. We're about done. Come around an aisle. Guess what I ran into? Cliff Gifford. It was so good to see him. And he acted like it was good to see me. And we had a good time of fellowship. And I told him, I said, I miss you. I said, oh, we'd love to see you. Will you come back? You pray for him. He told me, he said, well, maybe I'll pop in. Oh, it'd be good to see him. Huh? I told him that. I said, that's why we had to come to this Kroger. Because we had to run into Cliff. Uh, just let patience have its perfect work. Don't hound people. Don't just let God do a work and let God do. Just be disciplined. You take care of you, and I promise you, God will take care of the rest of it. Are you listening? But if you're going to be in control and have poise, it's going to take discipline. Because there's some days we don't do a real good job with discipline. There's some days the world will get the best of you. Some days the sorry, no good devil gets the best of you. Most of the time it's our own sorry, no good flesh. Amen. It's going to take discipline. Can I say this? It's going to take determination. I, I read that verse. In your patience possess ye your souls. The first time I read it, I didn't like it because it doesn't told you I don't have patience. And I read it. I read it. I kept reading it kept reading it. and I'm thinking I know what it means but that really doesn't mean anything if I think I know something and so I started just exhausting my library a little bit and one of the old writers I have that I've been reading after for 40 years I love this this old writer and I, I pulled that up and you know what I found brother Donald that word patience not only means to wait be disciplined and devoted and dependent. It also means to persevere. Persevere. Can I say, if we're going to truly be in control, we're going to have to persevere. We're going to have to be determined. Huh? Now, it absolutely boggles most people when they see my pretty little girl sitting back there who's five foot four to see her stats on the stat line on the basketball court they think there is no way she was in Chicago this year I was at the game she's playing the number 17 team in the country this team was very accomplished very good Sid went out and dropped 35 on them after the game one of the fathers of the other team comes up to her shook her hand 
He said, I was reading the stat line and I wondered how a five foot four guard could average nine rebounds a game. He said, now I know. He said, you was the best player on the court. Hmm? Now, can I say, she is not all of that because of her broken down old daddy. She is not all of that because of her massive stature. She has succeeded at every level in every sport she's played because she's determined. She's not going to let anything or anybody stop her. She's determined. One thing her dad did instill in her is if you make an error or you make a turnover, you forget it. Because if you dwell on it, you're going to make another one. You know what's wrong with so many people, Brother Charlie? They come to church, the devils beat them up where they blew it. They stepped in a mud puddle, they blew it, they had a bad day, bad week, they, they blew it, and they come to church and they can't forgive themselves because all they're reminded of is that. I taught her when it comes to playing ball, you've got to forget the errors. Or if you dwell on it, guess what's going to happen? You're going to make another one. Hmm? It's amazing. She can tell you every shot that her teammates miss, but it's amazing. She never remembers any of hers. <laughs> can I say that's what it takes? Mm -mm. Huh? She knows being a shooter, she's always open. Shoot or shoot. Mm? You miss a shot and you quit taking shots, you're never going to score. Can I say in the way of faith? Got news for you. You're going to have a bad day every now and then. You're going to step in a mud puddle. You're going to blow it. Now, I'm not excusing that. I'm not giving you a license to go out and blow it. But you can strive to live as close to Jesus as you want to. But sooner or later, your flesh is going to get the best of you. When it happens, get under the blood. Get it forgiven. Huh? If we'll confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, get it under the blood. Turn from it. Turn to Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Uh, and if he doesn't remember it anymore, why should you? Amen. Oh, now don't, don't live frivolously. Put a watch guard against your heart and say, by the grace of God, I never want to do that again, but don't dwell on it. Amen. Be determined that you're going to be the best saint of God today that you can be. And if God blesses you with tomorrow, be determined you're going to be the best saint of God you can be. You're going to live clean. You're going to point people to Jesus. You're going to have a good attitude and a good testimony. Why? Because you might be the very one standing between them and heaven or hell. Sure. Hmm. Back years ago when I trained salespeople, I used to tell salespeople cannot have a bad day. Why? Because you don't get a salary. You only make money if you sell stuff. And if you have a bad day, you're not going to sell anything. You're going to starve and your babies aren't going to eat. You can't have a bad day. Can I say something about Christians? You can't have a bad day. Hmm? Can't have a bad day. Uh, the Bible says we're written epistles known and read of all men. Somebody's watching your life. And if you have a bad day, they may trip up over your life and die and go to hell. Oh, you might have a bad moment in a day. Get it made right. But do not have a bad day. Because if you have a bad day, it might lead to another bad day and another bad day. And you have a bad week. And the next thing you know, you're so far out of the will of God that you're not in possession of your soul. You've got to be determined. Let me say this lastly. The power of patience, the power to control our soul lies within doctrine. If you don't put the Bible in you, if you don't heed to the messages you hear, and if you don't heed to what you read in your daily uh, uh, Bible reading, if you don't study the Bible and you don't learn the Bible, then my dear friend, you won't have any foundation. And when trouble comes, you'll crumble and nothing will help you. Jesus was instilling in them a foundation for, for when they would face persecution. They knew how to conduct themselves. Can I say? But a lot of times I didn't have a Bible with me, but the Bible in me kept me from absolutely wrecking my testimony. You better put the Bible in you. If the Bible's not in you, it's not going to come out of you. And I've learned this too. 
when the Lord puts somebody in your way to witness to them, it's amazing how much scripture will come out of you. But only if you put it in there. Are you listening? Hmm? Hey, a lot of nice vehicles out there in the, in, the, in the parking lot tonight. You don't put gas and oil in them, all they're going to be is a fancy looking flower pot. And they benefit you nothing. If you don't put the fuel of the Word of God and learn to discern the Spirit of God and follow Him, you're nothing than just a fancy flower pot for God. You want to be used of God? You want to be an instrument that God can take and impact another life? You've got to have the Bible in you. You can't be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. You'll never be able to make a stand when you're being flip-flopped all around. Remember Bill Clinton when he was president? Oh, man, he flip-flopped on everything. And the media gave him a pass. Huh? Hmm? And it also amazes me how some of these things that uh, some of these Democrats used to be for, and Clinton comes president wants to do them, now they're against it. Flip-flopping. Sure. You know why you need to put the Bible in you? It never changes. Yeah. And it'll cause you to never change. Say, Brother Doug, you're awful narrow-minded. Yeah, my mind's about that narrow right there. Because hmm? that'll get the job done, friend. Hmm? I've been studying this Bible for 45 years, soon to be 46 years. And I'm utterly amazed at how little I really comprehend. The more I learn, the more ignorant I realize I am. And more I realize how great he is. And I understand what John said. I must decrease and he must increase. I'm still amazed at this wonderful book divine. All the things that God has penned in here. It will help you through everything you'll face. Friend, if this Bible can't help you, my dear friends, you, yeah, there is no hope. But you know why he gave us a Bible? Because it will help you. I find those that the Bible doesn't help is because they don't have the Bible to help them. The Bible will help you, friend. You need to put the Bible in you. So what are you saying, preacher? The Bible says that if we have patience, that we'll possess our soul. In other words, we'll have poise and we'll be able to conduct ourselves in a godly way. You'll be in control. Can I say there's nothing worse than feeling out of control? Hmm. You say, well, I like it. Well, go down here on the highway, get it up to about 90, and just turn loose of the, of the wheel and turn the lights out and see how much you like it. That's no way to live your life. What will put you in control is having the patience to depend and be devoted to God, put the Bible in you, be disciplined and determined. And my dear friends, there's nothing that hell can throw against you that will leave you distraught. Oh, you might lose a battle every now and then. But if you get in that book, you'll find out we win the war. We've already won the war. That's why we can sing victory in Jesus. Because we have victory in Jesus. But so many people's lives are defeated because they're not poised. They're not in possession of their soul. They're allowing their circumstances. They're allowing other people's opinions. And they're allowing tactics of the devil to control them. And that is a bad place to be in. Learn the power of patience, the power dependent on God. And my dear friend, God will use you mightily in the dark days we live in. Let's all stand. Brother Ray, get a song of invitation. Just a little thought in that verse that I just wrapped my head around and I'm thinking, wow, there's a whole lot right there in that little verse 19. I wonder, will you ask God to help you to be poised when you face adversity? Will you come and ask God to allow you to be more devoted to Him and fall in love with Him? Will you come and thank Him for how good He's been to you? Maybe you're here tonight and you don't know Him. We'd love to introduce you to Him. Will you come and give your heart and life to Jesus? While folks are praying, they're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. It's a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. It's the very words of life. It's the absolute and final authority for our life. Lord, we can have poise and we can overcome things if we learn.
power of patience, being devoted, disciplined, dedicated to you. And God, help your people. There's some here tonight might be struggling, might need some help. Help them, Lord. God, do work in this invitation. Lord, help your folks to be sensitive. There might be somebody here tonight that is just really struggling. Don't even know how to look up. Maybe you want one of your youngins to go by and just put their arms around and say, I'm, I'm praying for you. Maybe somebody needs to go to somebody and just say, you've been a blessing. You've been an encouragement. Maybe somebody needs to go to somebody and just say, hey, will you pray for me? i got confidence in you. Lord, whatever's needed in this invitation, you just direct hearts and help folks to mind the Lord. Lord, we'll thank you for what you do, for it's in the holy and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.